Welcome to today's video conference with Ethnic News Media. Today, our topic is Imperial County, California's hottest spot for COVID-19, where infection rates are six times the state average. We'll also explore lessons it offers for fighting the surge nationwide. Today's conference is the 14th in a series we began on March 27, to track the impact of COVID-19. Over recent weeks, we have broadened our focus to topics that address deeper social inequities the pandemic has exposed. On behalf of EMS, I send our special thanks to Blue Shield of California Foundation for their support of this ongoing initiative. Today, we welcome back Dr. Tung Nguyen, who provides our weekly updates on the pandemic. And we send a special thanks to Professor Edward Flores and Anna Padilla of UC Merced's Community and Labor Center, who research data on wages and household sizes to help explain the surge in Imperial County and other areas of California. We will be sending a copy of their policy brief to all attendees, along with the video of today's conference later this afternoon. Finally, my thanks to veteran reporters Pilar Marrero and Sunita Sarabji for coordinating this initiative, and to all the reporters who are joining today's conference. Jessica Martin will offer instructions on how to enter questions for the speakers in our chat box. We will be inviting two to three questions at the end of each speaker and conclude the conference with 10 more minutes for Q&A. Jessica. Hi, welcome everyone. Thanks for joining. So we do use our chat function to enter questions and, to, uh, and that will be using uh, the bottom bar icon. Uh, if you go to the bottom of your screen, there's a bar of icons. You Click the chat function, you can enter your questions there. Um, if you are joining by smart cell phone, it will be three dots on your right hand side. You click those dots, the chat function will be there. If you are just dialing in, you will have to enter your questions by using the email and the invite. Um, but everyone who joins the call will be receiving our collateral. Great, okay. So now we begin with our uh, panel and we start with Pilar Marrero, our moderator. Thank you, Pilar. Thank you so much. Good morning, everyone. Thank you to all my colleagues for being here to cover this very important briefing. We have to talk about a very specific area of California that has been experiencing a high rate, the highest rate of COVID infections so far in California and see what lessons we can learn from them and how the community has organized there. But first, to talk about uh, a panorama, a panoramic view of what's going on with the pandemic. We have, as, as usual, Dr. Tung Wen, uh, who's going to give us probably the bad news. <laughs> Dr. Wen, go ahead. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah? Yes, yes, we can Great. hear you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you for having me on to talk about uh, sort of the overview. And um, uh, I appreciate your work uh, in getting the message out to our communities. Uh, so just uh, as usual, my, my, my overall summary, uh, as of yesterday, uh, there are 12.1 million people who have COVID-19 across the world and over 541,000 deaths. Uh, we crossed a very significant threshold, half a million deaths from COVID worldwide. In the United States, there were over 3.1 million infections and more than 133,000 deaths. Uh, in the last three weeks, uh, and I just happened to know this because I, I was uh, not looking at this for three weeks, uh, the number of infection in the U.S. has increased by 50%. Uh, another way of saying this is that in the last three to four weeks, there were one million new infections, while in the preceding 14 weeks, when we thought things were bad, there were two million infections total. Uh, the number of new cases are rising in 45 states. Uh, in 13 states, the number of cases are at least 60% higher than they were just two weeks ago. Uh, in Florida, Georgia, Louisiana, Tennessee, and Nevada, the number of cases are at least 100% higher than they were two weeks ago. So if that sounds like things are accelerating in the wrong direction, that is correct. Uh, ICU beds are filling up as well. Uh, 
The following states have 70% or more of their ICU beds already filled. Arizona, Nevada, Texas, Georgia, Kentucky, Tennessee, Alabama, and West Virginia. Nearly half of the ICU, I'm sorry, nearly half of the ICU units in Florida are already full. The death rates from COVID are also starting to rise in some states. I, I think you may have heard some argument that uh, the number of cases are going up because we're testing more, but you know, they're not so sick. Uh, that's actually not true. The fact that the ICU beds are filling up is one indication of that. The other is that the death rates are going up and this is expected because you don't expect the death rate to go up until about two weeks after the new cases are going up. So uh, we're seeing that now. Uh, Arizona, Texas, South Carolina, and Nevada in particular are notable for this. Um, it would be reasonable to expect that we won't see as many deaths only because now we have a couple of proven treatment that actually helped. So I'm sure that hopefully doctors are using them appropriately. On the transmission front, uh, a lot of scientists have been saying that COVID is being spread not only through droplets from coughs and sneezes, but also is airborne or aerosolized. This is actually a very important distinction because droplets, when you sneeze or cough, it falls down to the ground quickly, relatively speaking, and then it ends up contaminating surfaces and, and not stay in the air for so long. Uh, airborne, when the, 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 the virus is aerosolized into the air, uh, it actually can stay there for quite a while, uh, and it may still be in the air when someone else walks into where you've been breathing. Um, the WHO, which has been fairly adamant that this is not the case, has grudgingly admitted, I think, this week that uh, this airborne spread cannot be ruled out, particularly indoors. Um, it doesn't really make a huge difference as far as the community is concerned, except that I think it just means that this thing is very infectious. <laughs> uh, we already kind of know that, but uh, in the hospital, for example, when we talk about airborne precautions versus droplet precautions, we get revved up even more for airborne um, uh, transmission. Um, the good news for most people is that the mask will prevent either airborne or droplet transmission. Uh, but to date, only 22 states mandate mask wearing of some kind in public spaces. Uh, notably, the governor of Texas just finally mandated mask wearing in public spaces in, on July 13th, I mean, I'm sorry, July 3rd, but only in counties with 20 or more active COVID cases. And Florida, Florida despite its uh, uh, sort of increased numbers, uh, still has not mandated mask wearing. Uh, one item I wanted to pass on regarding uh, the, the prevention of transmission uh, is the FDA has listed some hand sanitizers that are toxic, uh, it needs to be disseminated to our community. What happened is that hand sanitizers have to meet certain standard of ethanol uh, percentages for it to uh, be effective. Uh, and, and these particular sanitizers actually has methanol, which is just one letter mm -hmm. change, but it's hugely important because methanol can be absorbed through the skin and is toxic to humans. Basically, in the old days, people used to make moonshine and that they, they make uh, uh, wood alcohol, which is methanol, and they drink it and they go blind. Um, and so this is when you start putting sanitizers on your hand that has methanol, uh, there are a lot of bad things that can happen. The reason why I wanted to highlight this was that it happens that all the products listed by the FDA with this problem were produced in Mexico. So it may be relevant to some minority communities. I will in the chat send you the link to the FDA uh, document that lists all of these uh, sanitizers. Uh, on the treatment side, um, I'm sorry to say that there are no new treatments that have been shown to improve COVID outcomes. Uh, I do want to note that uh, just as the uh, WHO stopped studies for hydroxychloroquine and another drug called ritonavir lopinavir because they don't work, uh, President Bolsonaro of Brazil decided to take hydroxychloroquine for his COVID infection, which is to show that uh, maybe our leaders and the signs uh, that they follow are not uh, congruent. Um, on the vaccine front, and this is the last thing I'll talk about, there are still 145 candidate vaccines, 22 are in human studies. The big news this week was that the NIH, National Institutes of Health, announced the creation of a COVID-19 prevention network to test vaccines and other types of prevention of COVID. Uh, they also launched a site, uh, website where people who want to participate in vaccine studies can sign up. And again, I'll send that link through the chat. Uh, I, look, take, I took a look at it. It's all in English at this point. So I think for a lot of issues uh, that are common to our communities, uh, if our minority members uh, wanted to sign up for these, there might be some issues. And certainly we can take a look at it and decide to send messages to the NIH to improve it. Um, so I'm sorry that I don't have good news. I have uh, pretty bad news, actually. And 
uh, things are not moving the right direction and uh, they may be getting worse. Dr. Wang, thank you so much. Uh, I know you have to jump off the call, but do you have time for one question? Yeah, I have five minutes for questions. Yeah. Oh, good. Okay, thank you. All right. Uh, so we have a question from Sunita. Sunita, go ahead. Hi, Dr. Wen. Um, as you know, as of uh, this week, uh, India has uh, the second highest rate of infections, but has uh, managed to keep its death rate relatively low to about 25,000. It's got... Um, uh, the U.S. has one-fifth of the population of India, and yet its death rate is six times higher. I wonder if you can explain that phenomenon. Uh, <laughs> that's a really good question. Purview? I'm not sure that I have the data to answer that question, but you, uh, I don't know the quality or the, the reach of the Indian health care system. Our health care system is not good. <laughs> so that's probably the first one. Uh, I don't know the age grouping of those who are getting infected in India. I know that the first wave uh, that we're still in, uh, a lot of uh, older and people with a lot of comorbid conditions were getting infected. And that's where people are dying from. We do have young people dying from COVID, but not very many. Uh, and so again, without knowing the age distribution and so on and so forth, it's hard to make a conclusion about uh, across systems. We, uh, thank you so much. Do you, we have a question from Fahmet, Fahmet Bakit. Mute. Uh, hi, doctor. How are you? Uh, I want to ask, what's the difference between self-isolation, self-quarantine, and physical spacing? That's one question. And the second, it's a quick, uh, why uh, we see that the whole world is more wor uh, worried and uh, warning about the, um, uh, the uh, COVID-19, but when we come to the United States, we don't see that much uh, uh, you know, uh, worry uh, about that. People coming from all over the world, from the airport, they're not even ask them or put them in isolation or do anything. Could you tell me about that, please? Yeah, so my, my uh, I think if I understand the question correctly, physical distancing is something that everybody should do uh, to avoid either catching or passing it on. Uh, whether or not you're at risk or not of getting COVID, physical distancing is the idea that you need to be at least six feet away from everyone. Uh, and you know, in these days and age, it should be combined with uh, 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 mask wearing. Uh, I, I don't think we should be do one or the other. We should do both. Um, you know, isolation is really uh, for people to can contain them from spreading infection when they're coming from a high risk area or that they have been exposed. And that actually means you basically go in a room <laughs> and stay there uh, and, and really try to minimize as much contact with other human beings as possible. Um, uh, as far as sort of why we are the way we are, I think that's a pretty broad question. I think a lot of us don't believe things until we actually experience it. You hear very commonly that, oh, I don't know anybody who had COVID, so this is probably not something that I need to worry about. There's a very common thing that people do with their health <laughs> until they know someone next to them who get it. They don't pay attention to it. Uh, that's pretty normal, but I think it's not been helped by uh, the way that our leadership, uh, some of our leaders have kind of talked about it to minimize it, uh, to uh, basically put science uh, and, and scientific recommendation uh, at, uh, uh, in doubt. I mean, when you start doing that, then people who already are kind of tilted to not wanting to believe something will continue to believe it. So, uh, so that I think is a thing. I, I can't say much about what the border controls look like at the airport. I don't know much about what's going on there. Before you jump off, Dr. Tung, Sandy has a question for you. Now, very quickly, Dr. Tung, we have learned that 15 cases from Imperial County were transferred to San Francisco. And I just wondered, what are the risks of transferring patients from that district? Yeah, so, so you know, as we saw with the experience of this, uh, the prison from uh, Chico to uh, San Quentin, anytime you send somebody who's infected to someplace else, that, that's a way to spread it. So it really, it's incumbent on the healthcare transfer to make sure that the person is well isolated and that the people taking care of them are. I know that at UCSF, we have dedicated units for COVID. So, uh, so, so I think, you know, we try our best and we try to use all the best uh, res uh, restriction, but that is a problem. I mean, when, when, when one hospital doesn't have enough people, I mean, enough beds, uh, that's a big problem in and of itself. But then when you start moving them to another hospital uh, or another area, that, that just sets up a, a potential route of transmission. So. Thank you so much, Dr. Dr. Gwen. Thank you. Right. Okay. Um, regarding the transfers, by the way, I want to say that I just spoke 
with Janet Angulo, the director of Imperial County Public Health Department, and I can provide an email for her for the media that want to ask her this question. She told me there has there have been 500 transfers from Imperial County because there's only two hospitals and they're an underserved community. But you can I can provide her contact so you can talk to her directly if you wish. So we're going to move on with our next speaker. And that is Professor Edward Flores, Assistant Professor of Sociology at the University of California, Merced, who has some data to share with us. Dr. Flores, go ahead. Thank you for being with us. Thank you, Pilar, and thank you, Sandy, for uh, organizing uh, this conference. Um, so uh, we, uh, the UC Merced Community and Labor Center recently, uh, or today, is releasing a report um, uh, entitled um, Hidden Threat. Um, and the report examines um, the role of the workplace um, uh, um, uh, in terms of um, the, the relationship between um, COVID transmission, um, uh, in terms of uh, uh, COVID transmission across geographies. And so we know that um, four months after the nation's first uh, stay at home orders, we still find ourselves continuing to debate the most appropriate way to, uh, um, to mitigate the spread of COVID. Um, and, and as you all know, these efforts have been largely unsuccessful. More than 2.9 million um, persons have been effect, uh, infected, more than 130,000 have died. Uh, and in addition to that, more than 20.5 uh, million jobs were lost at the peak of um, uh, the COVID pandemic um, uh, job losses in, in April. Um, but as public officials uh, and experts have grappled with closing businesses and regulating public uh, gatherings, a dominant narrative has emerged that COVID-19 has spread due to urban density, large public gatherings, and private behavior. Um, these explanations are inconsistent with um, uh, uh, several patterns and surges. Recent analysis of 1.5 million CDC records of COVID tests found that during the period of stay-at-home orders, COVID rates fell for all groups except for Latinos, whose rates surged the whole time during stay-at-home. The CDC data also suggested that COVID-19 transmission in suburban and urban, uh, suburban and rural regions um, sometimes outstrips uh, that in densely uh, populated urban cores. And so the recent outbreaks of COVID-19 among California farm workers in counties such as Imperial County, um, what we're talking about today, uh, or other places uh, like Ox Oxnard or Hanford, um, illuminate the central role of, of the workplace in COVID-19 transmission in uh, rural and suburban geographies. Um, and in our report, um, in our brief, we examined the relationship between the percentage of households in a county um, in which people worked and lived below a living wage. And so for those of you um, that might be unfamiliar with, unfamiliar with the term, a living wage is the minimum amount that someone needs in order to avoid consistent and severe housing and food insecurity. Um, our analysis looked at the relationship between um, uh, 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 the percentage of households in a county that um, had workers and, and lived below a living wage and, um, and COVID uh, uh, positivity uh, test rates. And we found a strong relationship between low wage work and COVID-19 positivity. Um, we also identified the industries that have the greatest prevalence of low wage workers and, um, and the likelihood of a federal paid sick leave um, by uh, the industry of workers, uh, you know, based on the exemptions that exist in the bill. Um, and so uh, our main findings were that, um, uh, first off, 18 of California's uh, 58 counties, um, as of a couple days ago, had COVID-19 positive test rates above 8%, right? The state set certain uh, thresholds for opening local economies back up. And one of the stipulations was that uh, positivity rates need to be below 8%. Um, as of July 8th, California had 18 counties that uh, had positivity rates above 8%. Um, and what we found was a striking relationship between um, uh, what we called county level worker distress, which is the percentage of households working and making less than a living wage and living in households that were larger 
than um, you know the state average. So we found a relationship between um, uh, worker distress and and positivity rates. Most counties um, that um, that were above the state average with worker households making less than a living wage and and and, and the size of the household. Uh, most counties that were larger than the state and those two measures um, were on the state's COVID-19 watch list with positivity rates above 8%, 12 out of 15. Um, this included Imperial. Imperial, which has 35.8% um, uh, uh, of households in Imperial are characterized by workers making less than a living wage. Um, that's third highest in the state. Uh, there's an average of uh, three people per household in Imperial, which is fourth highest in the state out of the 58 counties. Um, on the flip side, most counties with a low worker distress, those that have lower than average um, percentages of worker households making less than a living wage, um, and, and, uh, or you know, lower than uh, average size um, households, most counties with low worker distress were marked by low COVID positivity. Only four of the 39 counties that had low worker distress were on the state's watch list of counties that have above an 8% uh, COVID positivity th uh, uh, um, test rate. Um, so uh, what, what we're finding is, is that there's a relationship between worker distress and COVID positivity that's constant across rural, suburban, and urban geographies. Um, and uh, one other thing we did in the brief was um, to look at positivity by industry. I'm sorry. Um, one of the other things we looked at was um, the, the percentage of uh, worker households uh, making less than a living wage by industry. So we, had, we identified some industries in which um, uh, worker distress would be highest. Uh, agriculture was at the top of the list, followed by accommodations and food services, administrative and support and waste management, transportation and warehousing and retail. So we've been hearing stories about farm workers. We've been hearing stories about Amazon workers, uh, warehouse workers. We've been hearing about stories about grocery retail workers falling sick on the job. Essential workers who have no choice uh, but to show, uh, essential workers uh, who are not mandated to stay at home, uh, many of them who are low wage workers and fear the repercussions of missing a day of work because they, uh, they risk uh, constant and severe housing and food insecurity, even when they work. Um, and so our recommendations are a reporting COVID-19 positivity by industry um, so that we can understand how industries trends um, uh, affect COVID uh, transmission um, and, and so that our policy can play a critical role in appropriate, uh, developing appropriate workplace health and safety standards. Uh, we also recommend uh, improved workplace health and safety standards. Um, and uh, which not only protects workers, but would then protect the communities that they return to um, after working. And so lastly, we recommend a, a greater safety net for workers in essential jobs. Uh, millions of workers, most uh, workers are exempted from uh, uh, the Families First Coronavirus Response Act uh, stipulation of, of paid sick leave. Eight, about 80% are exempted because they work for employers that have over 500 employees or under 50 employees. Um, the act only applies to those persons who work for empl private employers between 50 and 499 workers, and most Americans don't work for, uh, for firms of that size. Um, and so, so our, our last recommendation is a greater safety net for workers in essential jobs because millions lack access to traditional unemployment benefits like undocumented immigrants, um, guaranteed sick pay because of the gaps in, uh, in the FFCRA, or even affordable health, health coverage. Um, so uh, such workers have, may have no choice but to work. And so consequently, uh, if we were to implement um, uh, a better health and safety standards by industry, if we were to develop them and to implement them, uh, it would still be necessary for us to have um, uh, um, a safety net in order to um, enhance the policy efforts to reform uh, workplace health and safety standards. Thank you, Professor. Thank you so much for that very important information. Um, I don't know if we have any questions for Dr. Flores. Please, uh, if you have questions, you have the chance now or at the end as well. Um, Pilar, if I could ask Professor Flores. I, this is such uh, valuable data in 
the policy brief. I just want to underscore its relevance to Imperial County. What you're describing is a pattern that is highly visible in Imperial County. The uh, connection between workers who make distress wages, if you will, wages below uh, a living wage and live in complex households, uh, households with more crowded conditions. So they have to go to work, they have to return home to crowded living conditions. Therefore, the standard healthcare guidelines, the public health guidelines for COVID seem to be irrelevant. They don't match the living conditions of the people who have to go to work in order to survive on a living on a sub minimum wage. And then they, if they were to stay at home or even go at home, they wind up in very crowded conditions. And you factor in just two hospitals for Imperial County. Um, could you just connect the relevance of your data? to the public health guidelines that seem to be geared to more mainstream living conditions. Yes, absolutely, Sandy. And thank you for pointing, making uh, uh, those connections clear. Um, so as you say, the, um, the guidelines for um, uh, reducing uh, COVID transmission um, uh, were developed um, in a way that applies largely to middle-class people that can afford to stay home from work, um, that, are, that can afford to miss work. Um, and uh, the, the guidelines that we have, even when we debate whether to close down businesses or to open them back up, um, uh, because we're so focused on regulating public behavior and opening and closing of businesses, um, our guidelines are not addressing the reality that there are a certain number of people that will have to work regardless. There are certain sectors of the economy that will continue to run uh, regardless. We eat every day and that food comes from somewhere. Um, and, and so if we're failing to address where it is that COVID was surging during the entire time of stay at home orders, then the, the problem is not going to go away when we um, have stay at home orders. Um, it's gonna continue to spread um, in ways that confound uh, the experts who are trying to give us guidance on how to reduce the spread of COVID. Okay, well, thank you so much, Dr. Flores. I think we're gonna move on because we have four more speakers. So, and we're going to go right into the community of Imperial County to hear from the people who are there on the ground. First, we're going to Luis Olmedo, Executive Director of Comité Cívico del Valle, Inc. Señor Olmedo, adelante, please. Um, Unmute him. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, hi, and uh, good morning. And uh, I'm very appreciative of all the experts in the room. And uh, thank you, Dr. Flores, uh, for characterizing the inequities and the social determinants uh, that really make it difficult for us to be able to have a good handle of COVID. Uh, the way that we uh, look at it um, is that this entire country was not prepared to deal with a pandemic. You know, the political divisions, the uh, lack of political will to address and to invest in these um, inequities that have been long characterized for many years through academics, through uh, healthcare, uh, through many experts have gone uh, ignored. And now we're dealing with COVID in a reactive manner. In the Imperial Valley, we have been dealing with endemics for a very long time. We have been dealing with deep cuts uh, to our uh, frontline workers, to our healthcare, who have never had, ever had the necessary resources to deal with the population that lives here, the economy that was created here for the border region. We are a major port. When we think about ports, we need to look at the bigger picture, not just the Bay Area, not just New York, not just uh, Los Angeles or the San Diego. We're an, an, an a major uh, inland import. Uh, port that also needs to get the same type of infrastructure and investment from the federal government and the state. We are interconnected in Mexico. It's not about pointing the fingers across each way. It's about recognizing and 
and um, acknowledging the fact that we have a much larger population. We're a metropolitan area. Just because California sees us all the way to the border and then stops uh, uh, their um, characterization of our border region uh, and looks at it as, as, a, as a rural, uh, sparsely populated area, that could not be farther from the truth. And the legislature has failed to recognize our daytime population. Uh, and previous administrations have failed to recognize our population. That's why we were underprepared, under-equipped, and years of deep cuts to our nonprofits, to our, our healthcare locally, uh, have also uh, put us in a, in a reactive uh, situation right now. Uh, it is natural to understand that whenever you have a crisis, as we do right now, that you're going to deal with the crisis in the most critical, uh, those most critical ill, those are uh, in the hospital, in the emergency care, and retool and requip, um, you know, from conversations that I've had with uh, our local hospital, which I, I stay more in contact with, Pioneer uh, Memorial Healthcare District, uh, who is one of our partners, and uh, they have the room, they have the space, they need the medical staff. You know, the county has, uh, in recent reports, have reported that we are medically underserved. We don't have the medical staff, we don't have the doctors, we don't have the equipment. We, and, and as it was mentioned by the medical expert earlier, we cannot rely on, on, on shipping uh, our patients, our critical ill to other hospitals because we, we put them at risk, not only to the patient, but also to other uh, regions. Um, we have to now that we've been months into this crisis, into this pandemic, we need to now have peripheral vision and our elected leaders. Uh, I'm very thankful that we have leaders such as our assembly member, Dardo Garcia, our governor, uh, Gavin Newsom, because if there was ever a time we get to choose our leaders to make money, make sure it's leaders such as them. But now we need to inform them. Again, I want to reemphasize that I'm thankful that Dr. Flores was able to characterize the inequities that exist here. If we don't take the war on COVID into our neighborhoods, into our communities, uh, we're going to lose the war on COVID. And more casualties will continue to, to occur. Uh, last numbers that I saw, and I'm pretty sure the numbers increased dramatically, is 125 people dead in our region. And this is not accounting for all those that are being uh, transported out or seeking medical care elsewhere. Um, it is, um, again, I, I'm very glad, and I, and I saw this actually in the chat box, that we're in the governor's watch list. And it's, and it's important to be on that list, but it's more important to be in the governor's emergency investment list. We need to, we need to uh, retool the nonprofits, just like we retooled uh, car manufacturers, we retooled industry to, to build ventilators, to build respirators. We need to bring back those resources. We need boots on the ground, being able to reach out, the harder reach population, uh, be able to change behaviors, being able to address the social determinants of health. If we don't address this in the entire picture, we're going to lose the war because we're always going to be on reactive mode. We should have been on proactive mode long ago, months ago, but we need to start now. And, and, and if I can get a message out uh, to the governor is we need that investment now, the singular strategy of addressing uh, our critical condition at the emergency room. It is important, it is urgent, but we now have to expand that in order to be able to address the, uh, the continued increase uh, in, in, in um, population, in, in, uh, in uh, increase in cases of COVID in these neighborhoods that were well characterized by Dr. Flores. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Luis Olmedo. Do we have questions for him? Nestor? Nestor, you can ask your question from Dr. Flores if you want. Thank you, Pilar. Thank you. Uh, and, uh, Dr. Flores, yeah, you, you, thank you for your presentation. I mean, it was quite clear the way that you detailed the severity of the situation. And of course, I mean, in Imperial County, we have 127 deaths and taking into account the, the number of people residing there, I mean, it's quite, quite serious. Uh, but, uh, we have Imperial County in the governor's uh, watch list. Uh, there's also a stay at home order, uh, but, uh, don't you think, and what's your answer to all those who at this point are saying it's imperative that we should come up with a lockdown, it's real lockdown. So following some models from other countries that uh, we come up with this uh, lockdown and also strict law enforcement. 
Of course, I mean, except for those essential workers that you were mentioning before that are key to our the economic structure. Um, thank you. Oh, uh, thank you. And um, I'm sorry, uh, um, were you asking the same question that you put in the chat box? Okay, so um, uh, I, I think the, the issue is that um, it's not enough to just have a stay at home order. Um, there has to be a safety net. And we see this in the Scandinavian countries. Sweden opened up their economy. They never had a stay at home order and they've had 40% more deaths per capita than the US. And their Scandinavian neighbors had stay at home orders, much lower death rates. But the difference is they have a safety net and we don't. And so uh, my report was just really emphasizing the importance of having that safety net because a stay at home order would not be as effective if it's surging in those communities that are required to work where we see COVID already surging. Thank you so much, Dr. Flores. Um, going back to um, uh, Luis Olmedo, uh, Luis, you have spoken about the endemic issues that made Imperial County, as you, as you told me the other day, the perfect breeding ground for, for this pandemic. Um, have you seen in the leadership of the, of the county or the cities in the county any willingness to address those? And what are you asking for? And then we'll move on to Luis Flores, who also can give us more details. Look, you know, I think it's important to recognize our entire valley is disadvantaged. Whenever we think about disadvantage, um, you know, it, we can't cherry pick, you know, what those things that we want to characterize or those, those conditions that we want to pick and, and address. This entire valley has been underfunded. Our cities have been underfunded. Our county have been underfunded. And then when we have a, a pandemic of this scale, it is expected that our health department is going to step up and fix all problems. And that's just not the case. We have been dealing with historic endemics such as the, the Salton Sea, which is this country's climate crisis. We are not able to solve that. And it has been nearly two decades where we had an opportunity to fix it. And the federal government has not stepped up. The state government now with Gavin Newsom is stepping up, but they're in a deficit. They have a long way to go before they put us on a, on a positive. We have the new river, which is well, well known, uh, known as the most uh, polluted river carries viruses that have been eradicated and, 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 and is the perfect conditions for, for these types of viruses like COVID to, to exist and, and, and to um, uh, be the, the ground zero for the pandemic. You know, a lot of times we think, well, this pandemic started on the other side of the world. You know, the conditions that exist here, this country is responsible for creating these conditions. We could have been the hotspot, the source where, where COVID could have started. Um, and so, Again, you know, the, the federal government has been able to deal with the cross-border pollution. The fact that it is very convenient for us to have this economy where, where the state uh, uh, benefits, our, our county benefits, uh, the federal government benefits. But again, you know, we're cherry picking what are those things we want to address. And I think the major, the, the, the largest issues, we, we're already 85% Latinos. You know, we keep talking about the numbers that were already um, uh, uh, shared that, Consistently, Latinos numbers kept increasing while some of the other ones were a little bit uh, slowing down or stabilizing. Latinos and communities of color uh, and in the conditions where these inequities exist is where COVID was thriving. Um, and um, again, if we don't address these inequities, we're, we're not gonna win the war on COVID. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, we, have, we have to have uh, the political will, we have to have the investment, and, and this is not a time for political divisions. We really need a legislature at the state level, we need a governor and we need a president, and, when, and, and we need a federal um, administration to step up and address these issues that have been documented for decades upon decades. Is it because we're Latino? Is it because we're low income? You know, what is it? There is no excuse, and now, you know, all these years where the can has been kicked down the road, we ran out of road. And now, now this responsibility feels like it's in the hands of, of Governor Newsom. It's quite unfair because where is the federal government stepping up in this situation? We need both the federal government and the state to invest 
and, and, and to pay back all those years of deep cuts and inequities that we're now facing, these social determinants of health, because it doesn't matter if we eradicate, and, and I believe uh, one of the doctors here locally uh, had mentioned uh, that we're soon may be an, a, an endemic. You know, what does that mean? We're going from pandemic to endemic, you know, that even if we eradicate COVID in this entire country, COVID is still gonna exist here, and we could be the reason that COVID is spreads back in these ongoing waves uh, throughout the country, throughout the state. Thank you, Luis. We're going to move on to Luis Flores, activist with the Imperial Valley Equity and Justice Coalition. Um, Luis, you, you were part of a group that wrote a letter and pushed back on the county when they were trying to uh, move on to phase two, to get some exceptions, to reopen the county. Please tell us what happened and how the community organized. Yeah, thank you for the invitation. So just a bit of background. We're, we're a group of about 12 um, sort of um, uh, community sort of rooted organizers um, and and we have a sort of a, 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 a group of around 2,000 sort of community members that we are in contact with that emerged out of this petition. Uh, so I'll, I'll give a brief sort of overview of, of sort of what that was and what we're focusing in now. Uh, so yeah, on June 3rd, the, the Imperial Valley Board of Supervisors um, asked, um, uh, appealed to the, uh, to Governor Newsom that, they, that this entire state move ahead to stage 2B, which would um, which would be a departure from the county by county movement toward reopening um, that Imperial County would, would be very far away from qualifying for. So we, we understood this to be as an ask for an exemption from, from, from county metrics on account of, of sort of, of unique conditions of, of the borderlands. So, um, so we, we started a petition of a group of, fr of concerned friends um, that quickly turned into uh, a pretty large um, um, sort of a list of folks who um, gave us testimonies um, and um, and we sort of wrote um, a rebuttal to the governor. We um, wrote um, press releases and, and, and were successful at getting the media attention. And a few weeks um, and later, we, we think in part, in part from these efforts, but also uh, because of the media attention and because of just how, how severe the crisis was getting. Already in June 3rd, when the county sent this, we were at the top of the charts for the state, number one, on both deaths and infections, we've remained we've remained at that position, but the metrics are just worse. Um, so, um, so the and the governor sort of I think recognizing these things asked not only sort of um, denying that request from the board, but sort of a, a, a request that they move back uh, to something like stay at home. Um, so um, since then, sort of. Uh, we think a lot of the things where we are advocating for, we've, we've made strides on. There's been a focus on resources as opposed to sort of the, the date of reopening. We're sort of still concerned about the sort of the, the lack of, of a, accountability that's built into the county response. All the language is in terms of strongly encouraging um, a series of measures uh, with no sort of mechanisms for accountability. Um, but we're turning now to working with, um, with other coalitions like the Comité Civico, uh, the Imperial Valley Community Health Coalition and others um, uh, to push to push it for for uh, for an equity focus on 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 sort of where we go now. So I'll say really briefly some some major take um, major takeaway and then some of the specific things we're sort of um, uh, pushing for now. Um, so some things that we we sort of I think are pushing for is first this sort of false choice or an artificial choice between. Um, sort of economic um, stability and public health, right? And I think Professor Flores' research is, is sort of uh, speaking to this. Um, this is an artificial choice because with the proper um, uh, and accessible um, economic supports and safety nets, um, workers um, and business owners, small business owners don't have to make these choices about sort of going, to home, going home if they're sick or not feeling well, fearing getting tested because they may uh, jeopardize their um, their economic stability or businesses, small businesses feeling like they, they have to expose themselves um, uh, uh, in order to sort of uh, keep their business, right? This is an artificial choice. Um, and uh, the county sort of um, was initially sort of ma making this argument and we've sort of pushed back on it. Um, the second thing is that we're pushing back at what I think is kind of a, a border exceptionalism, the sense that uh, the problems of, of Imperial County um, are so exceptional, they, they're, they're so particularistic 
that they that they sort of are um, must be you know they they that that they that that they either require different metrics or um, or not part of broader trends and and a lot, and what we're pushing for I think is is rather than treating the Imperial County as exceptional that it's it's simply a very dramatic version of inequalities that are common in immigrant communities low income working class communities across the country so. Um, there is a there is a transnational twist to sort of um, our our uh, to to the to how dramatic our crisis is, which and we know that uh, workers of color across the country have to sort of traverse long distances in risky public transit to to work in low wage and and sort of precarious jobs. That's happening in the county across the across a, a, a front, an international frontier. But it is a labor problem, right? It's it's not this exceptional problem that we we can't sort of measure and sort of understand in the same way that we understand uh, sort of um, racial and socioeconomic injustices in other places. So we're trying to say we're 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 a dramatic but not exceptional version of of, of things that are going on elsewhere. So the same kinds of of tools with more resources uh, sort of should should be applied here that that they're um, that we use for addressing inequities in other places. So. To, 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 to close, some of the things we're pushing for now, so we're collaborating with the local ACLU to really push for uh, data on disparities, for equity data. We don't have data on where the workplaces where people are getting this um, is um, sort of, we don't have socioeconomic data and we don't even have robust racial data. So policy is just happening in the dark and, and there's, no, there's, there's no data to inform interventions that, that Professor Flores' research shows should be focusing on, on workplace, um, the enforcement of workplace safety, safety nets, these sorts of things, and also the multi-generational character of households. Um, we're pushing for clear mechanisms of accountability. Again, it's not about only about private behavior, but it is about workplaces, which means holding large-scale farmers and, and large retailers accountable. That is not happening. Um, it means addressing um, housing precarity low wage workers are also um, ha higher risk of becoming, uh, of experiencing housing insecurity. So right now we're pushing at the city level to pass city level um, housing uh, sort of eviction moratoriums um, like, like sort of the, the, the governor has allowed us. Um, and finally sort of, um, yeah, we're, we're really pushing for the workplace dimension of this to, to, to make the, the rights and assistance that already do exist known and accessible because even when they're out there, um, it, it's not enough to just sort of post them on, on social media or to sort of announce them. They, they need to be made accessible mm -hmm. to people that are, are often Spanish speakers, um, uh, have, may have connectivity issues uh, with internet and, and have uh, discomfort with bureaucratic sort of um, uh, language and, and things. So thank you for, for having us. Luis, I have a question for you because both, both you and, and Luis Olmedo talked to me about how the COVID pandemic has kind of um, re-energized co local community organizations. Um, so is, is this what's happened? Uh, has, it, has this led to more act, you know, activism from those very essential workers and essential people in the community that are more vulnerable? So I think yes. One of the really powerful um, products of what we've done is a is a series of 600 testimonies uh, from people that signed our petition, um, and these testimonies just spoke to very clearly that people understood what was happening. People understood the sorts of interests that 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 this appeal represented um, to to speed up reopening, and people understood that how false these choices were. But I think people um, sort of didn't quite know. What, what the outlets were for this kind of, for, for what, what was, you know, a clear uh, sort of uh, problem of representation. So we do think that um, our organization emerged out of this. We know the Imperial Valley Community Health Coalition emerged out of this. And, and I do think that, that people are, are sort of, the, the, the existential or the sort of the life and death dimension of this really um, is, is bringing people into a political arena. Okay, um, uh, thank you very much. Um, there are no questions right now, but we'll have another chance to go to questions. Um, next, we have uh, with us Michelle Garcia, who is a, a nurse from Calexico Wellness Center, and she has been seeing patients 
Um, she has been consulting with patients, um, not just COVID, but in general. And she has some, something to tell us about the health vulnerabilities in the area. Michelle, thank you for being with us. Thank you, Pilar. Thank you so much. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you. Thank you. Okay. So I'm a nurse practitioner and I currently work at two different facilities. Right now I do telemedicine with Clutchco Wellness Center and um, also in Laguna Hills separately. But what I see is that on a consistent basis is that I have patients who are lacking the education on how to improve their condition. Obviously, I think that there is a huge disparity with Hispanics and diabetes and all the other cardiovascular risks. However, they come to me and they truly do not know how to um, manage their diabetes. I have patients who don't monitor their blood glucose levels, are eating all the wrong things. Uh, they don't, uh, they take very, they have to go to work, so they have to, families to, to support and things like that. They don't even come in to get their medications regularly checked and refilled and so forth. I have patients who tell me that they borrow their sisters, uncles, friends, medication. I took this because she had this. So there is a severe lack of education that's going on here. And this is a major component as to why COVID is so high. Michelle, um, have you, have you uh, diagnosed anyone with COVID in your consultations? I know you do tele, telemedicine, you do teleconsulting at this point. Yes, I've had um, a few cases of po positivity with COVID, yeah. Mm -hmm. and Do you, go ahead, please go ahead. No, sorry, go ahead, yeah. No, I was going to say that people may not be educated about their own um, pre-existing conditions, let's call them that way, but uh, do they have access to enough education? Do they have access to enough medical care, given that we know this is a medically underserved community? No. Uh, yes, they, they have access in the sense that um, we have a clinic there. However, they, there are so many patients that we have that just do not get the appointments that they, that they need due to whatever reason. Uh, they're working and they can't do it. They don't know how to operate um, their phones and, and things like that. So I'm, when I see patients, I'm lucky if I get to see them via camera. Uh, sometimes it's just via phone. And so there's so much more you can do with a face-to-face -face consultation versus on the phone. So yes, they have the ability to do so. However, lacking the proper knowledge on how important it is to take care of your health and things like that, I think that's what's missing. I think we need to spread that message and make that clear. Diabetes is a severe, a severe condition and thus, you know, it it affects every, every organ in your body. You know, I cannot begin to tell you how many patients I have who are nutri like they lack the education with nutrition and going through their diets with them. It's, they, it's like there's, there's something missing. They do not see the connection. And that's where I am so happy to be able to provide them with that knowledge that I have and in hopes that, you know, if I can change the life of one patient who can then change the life of their family or friends, that makes me happy. Mm -hmm. Okay, we have a couple of questions for you. If you can answer, uh, please do. Uh, Nestor, please ask your question. Yes, uh, hello, uh, Michelle. Uh, taking into account that, that you work in, in a hospital, uh, I wanted to know if uh, you're facing the same uh, situation that we faced uh, here in uh, LA County. Uh, yesterday, I went to a hospital, and I mean, uh, I had to wait uh, an incredible amount of time um, to be able to, to be tested. Uh. Do you have bottlenecks at this point? Actually, I do not work in a hospital. I work in, a, in two separate clinics. Okay. So... What do you know about the testing? Uh, do you know, can you tell us anything about the testing? Are your patients able to get tested uh, easily? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so I, I believe Blanca and I are setting up a date, separate dates where we can test patients just strictly on COVID. So via, I think we're trying to get together via either face-to-face -face and do it in Clexico or at least on the phone. 
So yes, we're working on trying to improve that. Yeah, and we can provide you, Nestor, with the, with the um, contact information for the director of Imperial County Public Health Department, who's not on this call, unfortunately, but we have her contact and she can talk to you about testing sites and all that. So thank you so much. Sunita, you had a question for Michelle? Yes, I do. Um, Michelle, how severe do you believe the undercount to be um, in your area? So pretty severe, yeah. Um, patients, I, I really, I don't know who which speaker said this, but there's, there are patients and pe persons who are afraid to be tested because of the, the fact that they'll have to stay home and thus, you know, I mean, how do you choose between I have to feed my family, my kids are not gonna eat, um, and or let me go out and make some money for wages for my family. So that's a huge thing right there. Um, so yeah. to answer the, yeah, yes. It's thank, thank you so much, Michelle. We have to go uh, briefly to our next speaker because he has to jump off the call at noon. So sure. um, uh, may, we may go back to, to the other speakers uh, for questions. So Armando from the United Farm Workers. Armando, can you please uh, share with us? And I know you've been working all throughout the states on the conditions of, of farm workers. And you told me that you have a lot of farm workers that are infected that you know. Please t talk to us about what's going on in, in, in the fields and in the packing plants and all those things. Thank you, Pilar, and thank you everybody for having me. Uh, and I apologize, I, I have a, a, a hard stop at 12. Uh, but um, yeah, we've been obviously dealing with this since the beginning, uh, trying to engage the agricultural communities, uh, but first by starting to send out letters, asking the growers, contractors, uh, and others to, uh, to step up immediately. Uh, unfortunately, most uh, that call, those letters went unheeded uh, because most growers uh, continue to uh, work and do uh, operations as normal uh, and and we're now seeing the effects of that throughout the entire country uh, California obviously uh, and I can see that we have three major issues we're facing one wherever there is close contact such as h2a workers having to carpool together having to live together there's a higher propensity of, uh, of infection uh, facilities that have a, a lot of surface space, such as packing houses, production facilities, et cetera, that workers can touch more often. Uh, we're seeing a lot more outbreaks there. Uh, as a matter of fact, we're dealing with one right now, uh, uh, not in Imperial County, but it's in Wasco, California, where uh, one processing facility has 91 employees that are infected, uh, 36 family members, 23 children, uh, for a total of 150 coming out of one facility um, and all because the employer wanted to keep things quiet because they wanted production. They wanted to, did not, did not want their, their production impacted. And so they literally did not communicate with their employees about uh, what was happening to try to stem the spread. Uh, and similarly with guest workers, as they're carpooling, we're seeing operations in Salinas where 150 workers uh, our house together. They're starting to, it's starting to spread. Uh, King City starting to spread. Uh, and the third part of it, which is also going to cause huge issues, is employers are refusing or failing to pay the employees for the CARES Act sick pay. As you all know or may know, California expanded it to include uh, the uh, food supply chain uh, so that regardless of size of the employer, it would also apply. But we're hearing countless of workers left and right trying to figure out what to do because their employer is refusing to pay them for either coming positive, uh, having to quarantine themselves because their loved one is positive, uh, and or just outright terminating them, and that's how they're dealing with it. Not, not everybody, you know, I also want to stress that not everybody uh, does that. We also have some of our union em unionized employers are just going above and beyond, you know, saying, hey, if you're 65 years or older, we're going to pay you to stay home if you want to. Uh, if, if you have any symptoms, stay home. We'll take care of you. And being very proactive uh, by um, also socially distancing but, um, and adding additional safety precautions. But 
I think uh, it's, it's spreading as now that the harvests are going on uh, a lot more throughout California, throughout the nation. It's definitely spreading a lot faster. And uh, with employers now basically continuing operations as, as usual and even blaming the employees uh, that that's their fault because they didn't, they, they, they didn't take care of themselves. So we're definitely seeing a lot more of that. Uh, and with the undocumented status of most of the agricultural community, that's even harder. With guest workers being deathly afraid, not just for their health, but for their family's financial income, because if they say something, they are totally afraid that they might not be brought back the following year. Uh, so all those different variables are contributing to the spread, in my opinion. Thank you, Armando. And I know you had to leave, so thank you so much for joining us. Sorry that we couldn't get to you till this time. No, no, I appreciate it. All right. uh, like I said, I put my email and my yes. uh, media contact on the on the on the on the chat. I apologize. Mm -hmm. I just have a have a, another meeting that I had to could get out of. Yeah. So, and Armando is pretty easy to reach, so write to him uh, and and he'll respond. Thank you so yeah. much. Thank you all. Okay. So um I, I actually want to go to Luis Olmedo, who was answering in the chat regarding the testing, because he has something to say about it. Luis, can you can you say what you what you were uh, putting here in the chat regarding testing? Uh, yeah. So um, I think it's the way I'd like to answer this is, um, you know, I I definitely respect the space of the the medical staff, the healthcare staff, the county, and and, and, and all the experts, and that's what we rely on for our messaging, but at the same time, we have to understand the realities and some of these political realities that when uh, this in initial pandemic started hitting uh, this country, the state and this region, you know, we heard a lot of uh, promising uh, messages that PPE is coming, tests are coming. And I think that a lot of the elected officials got ahead of themselves and we waited and we waited and we waited and it didn't get here for a very long time in 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 re reference in relation to the urgency that we needed it uh so we did have some like private doctors and here locally we have dr bovo medical and i remember many conversations with him and he says you know what nobody's telling me where to go nobody's giving me a seat at the table i'm gonna do this i'm gonna save lives regardless of what anybody else is is, is saying or or not saying and uh and and so we saw him go out there uh outside of protocol and, and, and went out to save lives. That's what he wanted to do. And then we didn't see testing. Um, uh, he started doing drive-through testing when we didn't really see official tests happening until quite a, quite a bit later. Again, you know, that's because you're seeing what, you know, the importance of bringing in private doctors, the nonprofits, a lot of these, we don't have to go through these bureaucratic hurdles, these red tape, in order to be able to go out there. They're ready to go out there. They just need more resources and the ability to put this resource out there at a much faster rate than government. We forget that a lot of times, even though there's an emergency, it doesn't mean that we wipe the protocols off the books. It means that they, they are moving a much faster space, but they still have to go through the red tape and through the protocols. And I think that's what you also heard what the governor said several times, is that we're getting this PPE, but it's stuck here, it's stuck there, it's in contract, it's, you know, and these things are failing. And that's the reality of the bureaucracy. So. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Luis. Thank you. Um, I think we're going to stay on a few more minutes. Uh, we have a few questions on the chat in the chat. And Frank, Bla Frank Blanquette, you have a really good question here. Yeah. So, so my question, and, and I guess the, the, it could be answered by by a, a number of you guys. But what what is being done to deal with communication issues for migrant workers that only speak an indigenous language and are not fluent in English or Spanish? How do you help them communicate or communicate to them that they need, when they need medical attention and, and other services? Michelle, do you have anything to say here regarding uh, indigenous languages? Uh, can you um, unmute Michelle Garcia? Thank you. I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't hear the question. The question has to do with um, migrant workers who only speak an indigenous language. Is there any capacity there? Well, um, it's unfortunate. Um, we don't have all the knowledge that we can at this point to help them, and it's it is a serious issue. Um, I wish I could say that I knew of another solution, yeah. but right now it's 
it's pretty bad. Yeah. Um, in regards to those patients that I see that are Hispanic, that's and, and that speak Spanish, that's obviously I can help them. I can help them. However, the message isn't getting across. That's mm -hmm. just how it is. Um, so I'm sorry. That's all I can say about that. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you so much. Uh, do you have anything to add, Luis Flores? regarding the indigenous population? You no, know, I, I, I don't know much about that, but I'm, I'm not uh, optimistic. I, I think the, um, it's been hard to reach Spanish-speaking um, folks, uh, particularly precarious workers, which I imagine doesn't bode well for um, reaching folks that, yeah, where, where the language is not the dominant language like Spanish is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so uh, we're gonna go to until just four more minutes. Um, what can the press and the public do uh, to help uh, any of you? Um, please, please tell us what we can do to help uh, with the situation in Imperial County. Anyone? Yeah, so I think one thing I'll highlight is, and I know Professor Flores mentioned this well, as well, but to sort of, um, to really push for, for data and as opposed to sort of um, kind of, um, anecdotal, uh, I think we, we need to re rely on a lot of strong anecdotal stories, um, but sometimes the focus turns to private behavior, um, to, oh, I saw a party happening, therefore sort of transmission is happening at parties. Um, we don't actually know that, and, and so I think pushing for and looking for the, those, 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 that data that would, would actually like tell us where it's happening, um, particularly in workplaces, I think is, is really important. Thank you so much. Um, we have, I don't know, we're, okay. Okay. Uh, I, I thought I might chime in for a second. Yes, um, please go ahead, Professor. In regards to what's important in, um, in Imperial and, and beyond, um, there's, um, there's an emergency standard that advocates are calling for uh, Cal OSHA, uh, uh, Occupational Safety and, and Health in, in the state of California. Um, the Agency for California for Health and Safety in California to adopt an emergency standard that's COVID related, um, and so uh, that would go a long way in uh, in addressing the fact that COVID is spreading in the workplace, even when we shut everything down. Um, so, so I think that's something. Uh, I mean, I, I could circulate that information for anybody that's interested as well. Okay, um, what does that mean, uh, Dr. Flores? Emergency standard. How would how would it change? He's muted. Can Did you he... unmute Ed Flores, please? Please unmute. Hi guys. Okay. okay. So um, there's many uh, things in the emergency standard that uh, that um, advocates are asking for the board to uh, um, to approve next week on Thursday. Um, some of these items include collecting information um, uh, that's industry relevant to to COVID positive tests. Another um, important item is having someone, uh, having business, uh, mandating that businesses have one person, one worker in each work site that's trained on um, uh, you know, COVID related safety and reporting um, uh, and that they work uh, with, a, with a worker or labor organization um, in order to have better oversight of, of COVID health and safety standards in the workplace. Um, thank you so much. Before I go to Sandy, I want to invite Blanca Morales, who is the executive director of the Calexico Wellness Center. She has something very important to talk about here, uh, to say briefly. Blanca, can you talk about this lack of technology? People don't have phones to do the telemedicine? Yep. Yeah, please, please go ahead. Blanca, are you there? Blanca Morales, can you unmute her? I think she's not able to connect. She's not connected to the audio. She's not connected to the audio. Okay, okay. Well, she she was she was mentioning that the people there do not have smartphones, and it's, it's can I it's really... can I say something about that? I'm yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Go I think ahead, what Michelle. she's trying I think she's trying to say is is the fact that there are patients that I cannot see because they do actually do not have access to smartphones. So getting them that, that technology 
supporting them with supplies, with food, things like that would help them, would help us and thus create, you know, a better response. Um, so yeah, that's what, I think that's just what she's trying to say. Okay, okay, many, many details. Thank you so much. Uh, Sandy, go ahead to close. To close I, this I just meeting. wanted to close us off by saying it is media attention that drew us to Imperial County. We probably would not have done this briefing had we not seen an excellent story in the Chronicle. And what led to the story was the activism by some of the people on this panel and their organizations. In other words, this isn't just about victims. This is about a impact the pandemic is having to mobilize people when the government and the public health protocols are no longer relevant to their survival. Mm -hmm. Finally, in terms of the data, I think foundationally for our coverage, the policy brief that Dr. Flores and Anna Padilla have put together for us provide very important uh, data that support some of the anecdotal, the very eloquent descriptions people have made of the situation in Imperial County as a microcosm of the factors that are leading to surges in areas we don't often pay attention to, and that there's so many lessons we can learn uh, from reporting on Imperial County that are relevant to a much wider sector of California and of the United States. So thank you, Pilar, for coordinating today's briefing. And thank you on behalf of all of us journalists to the speakers. We've really just scraped the surface of this very big story. You'll be getting everyone's name and contact information and the video. Uh, and we hope you all will follow up on what we've just started as I hope more in-depth inquiry. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Take care of yourselves.